Welcome everybody to the, our session this evening for the How To Academy. It's an evening with Shlavoj Zizek in conversation with me, Robert Roland Smith. You're all very welcome. Um, our session is going to run for an hour this evening until half past, and we'll break it down into um, kind of three sections, roughly. I'm going to ask Shlavoj uh, in, a, in a moment about his views on the on the pandemic. And then we'll go on to talk about his, his latest book, Hegel in a Wide Brain. There it is, flashing it up before you. And then we'll have some time for question and answers from you guys. And uh, just a bit on the tech for the Q&A. You should see on your screen a box at the bottom of uh, your screen that says Q&A. You can use that throughout the conversation to put your question down. And then when it comes to the Q&A section, which will be about after about 40 minutes of discussion, I will then pick out some questions to pose to, to Shlevoy for him to respond to. So I hope that's clear um, and uh, we'll see how we go. So first of all, Shlevoy Zizek, very nice to see you, very nice to meet you. Welcome from Ljubljana, I think you are. Thanks very much. I am honored to be at least in my spirit there. Yeah. Very good. Um, so clearly these are strange times and it would be a very odd thing for me not to ask you about the pandemic, uh, not least because you've already managed to put a book out about it. It came out three or four months ago already, I think. Uh, pandemic with an exclamation mark, like a, maybe like a horror film would have an exclamation mark after it. Though it also made me think of musicals as well, you know, Pandemic the Musical. But um, I wanted to ask you, first of all, I guess, to say a little bit about your views there. And I suppose especially this point that you make, which is a little bit controversial at the time, yes that there's no hidden meaning to this pandemic, that the virus is a kind of empty signifier of some kind. So I wanted you to maybe explain a little bit what you meant by that. And then secondly, if you still believe that that's true. Uh, it's true, which doesn't mean that, it's, that the epidemic is not simply uh, a purely biochemical or whatever natural phenomenon. Of course, it's conditioned by complex social, even ideological and so on circumstances. Just imagine the same thing happening, let's say, in early 1950s in Wuhan. Probably we wouldn't even have heard about it, you know. I'm not saying this. I am just a uh, uh, afraid of this, I call it, maybe I am unjust here, new age temptation to look for some deeper meaning in the sense of Mother Nature is sending us a warning or whatever. Of course, we are co-responsible for it and so on. But we should never forget that virus is maybe the stupidest form of existence that you can imagine. For some people, I read, Stupid in the sense that they simply exist to Stupid in the sense that some biologists even don't count it as a form of life. It's just a kind of a, some most uh, scientists claim, chemical mechanism of self-replication. It doesn't have any intention, there is no deeper meaning in it, and so on, and so on. That's all I meant. Don't fall into this new age stuff or mother, mother nature is sending us a warning. You know why I think, why I insist on this? Because I think that's the only way to really confront catastrophes like this. My enemy here, theoretical enemy, are those new agers, but not only new agers, who see all natural catastrophes as results of our human hubris. As if prior to us, nature found some kind of balance, homeostasis, then we disturb this homeostasis, exploiting it too much, and so on and so on. To be very short, sorry. Let, yes? let me just check, Shlevo, you, that you're, I don't think you're saying this, but let me check. You're saying that there was no human agency that played any part in the outbreak no, of the virus? No, absolutely not. All I'm saying is that we should never forget that our main sources of energy today, coal and oil, can we even imagine what kind of mega catastrophes on Earth had to happen well before human race emerged on Earth for these catastrophes to happen? That is to say, it's not that before 
humanity, nature was a kind of a benevolent mother in balance and so on and so on. No, uh, if I may put it in slightly but still tolerably uh, uh, vulgar terms, is nature is our mother, it's a dirty bitch of a mother, you know. And things can happen. We have to accept it. Virus, an asteroid may, may hit Earth and so on and so on. Nature has this element of contingency, not in the sense that it doesn't uh, nature follow so-called natural laws. If a mega asteroid hits Earth and destroys at least human life, of course, it's not a natural contingency. It will follow precise laws. But from the standpoint of human history, it's a contingent nonsense. But I deeply agree with you that one has to use the old-fashioned Hegelian term, a little bit too bombastic here, that we have to see the phenomenon of epidemics in its totality. It's a biochemical phenomenon. It's, of course, as everyone knows, uh, uh, dependent on the, on the explosive development in China, on their habits of how they nourish themselves, on international travel, and so on, and so on, and so on. And uh, that should also give us, don't be afraid, I will finish very soon, some hope. Because if it were simply a natural phenomenon, we couldn't do practically anything. So let let but, me ask you this. Then. Yes. Let, let, me, let me come in and ask yeah. you this. So there is a sense in which the, uh, you know, the Earth is bigger than the human species, but you're not invoking any kind of Gaia uh, principle around this. What I wanted to ask you about then yeah. is the, the, the human interaction with the p pandemic in terms of the politics of the handling of the yeah. virus. Yeah. And what's your view of that currently, and whether that's moved on from your book in the spring? The only good thing that I see in it, although it's not yet clear, is that populism obviously didn't and doesn't work. At the beginning, you remember a couple of months ago, many people, and even if we have different views, we are basically horrified by the ongoing right-wing anti-immigrant and so on populism. That this will be their moment. It doesn't look so bad. Look at United States, Brazil, even in your country, uh, Boris Johnson playing a little bit of a popul populist card, Putin in a different authoritarian way playing a populist card. It doesn't work because, you know, you cannot bluff endlessly like Trump does here. We, we have a real problem, numbers, tell something. But if I may add another thing which interest, I hope, thing which interest should interest both of us as philosophers. You know, people know that it's not only a health problem. There is also, an, obviously, it will explode more in the poll, a problem of economy. What will it mean? And I don't mean just uh, this fall of uh, brutal national product and so ever, but these serious problems like if borders are not open and they open and they shouldn't be, I agree, who will do the harvest in the fall? Especially in the countries which rely on hundreds of thousands of immigrant workers coming. That's one thing. The other thing where I was a little bit disappointed. Let, uh, me, just stop you. let, me, let me just stop you on that point about closing yeah. borders. Are you saying or are you not saying there's some way in which the closure of borders will or won't be recruited or exploited by political groups of the right or left? They already are exploited, of course. But, uh, but I nonetheless think that we should, naive as it may sound, keep a strict distinction between all the necessary measures, quarantine, closing the borders, not only our nation state and the other one, but even within nation states, and the rightist exploitation of this topic. Isn't it interesting? What interests me, okay, we cannot lose time here, but the supreme paradox, how in the opposition to quarantine and other state-controlled measures, populist right is often united with some extreme leftists. Like, did you follow a couple of days ago, almost a week ago, the big demonstrations in Berlin, Berlin, capital of Germany. No, 20,000 people demonstrated against coronavirus claiming in that the only conspiracy is the conspiracy that there is a virus epidemics at all. 
interestingly enough, just look at the photos. On the one hand, old hippies playing reggae and so on. On the other hand, Pegida, the extreme right-wing national party and so on. They both see all these measures, uh, uh, controlling your movement, uh, quarantine and so on, as means for the state to control us, to control the population, to install panic, fear, and so on and so on. I don't buy this. I think that the paradox is that, the, if anything, the populist right is in large majority the anti-mask anti tendency, how should I call that, you know. But can I add just something which may interest you as a philosopher? I don't just make fun of them. Are we aware, and even more than this empirical uh, problem like economy, international conflicts, wars, we can go into this later. What people are not aware enough is something which is more than just mental, psychic breakdowns. It's that our basic, I'm almost tempted to say, spontaneous ontology, the way we relate to external reality, to social reality, how we communicate with others and so on, is shattered. And um, psychic mental breakdowns are going around. It's literally that our everyday normativity, if I may use this word here, norms, not in an idealist way, but simply unwritten rules, norms, which regulate our interaction, is threatened so that literally the way we behave now, I don't want to be accused of biological determinism, but let's say the way it appears to us natural to behave to others is threatened. So that, isn't it? Some critics noticed, I love this, that it's not just the para uh, paranoia, psychotic reactions. I like also the obsession and neurotic reactions. Like my, some, I have some friends, I am among them, who are obvious obsessional neurotics. And in a way, I enjoyed the quarantine. Uh, wash your hands all the time, don't touch even yourself. It's a neurotic paradise, I mean, obsessional. So what I'm saying is don't underestimate this radical dimension. Our whole, the popular term would have been Lebenswell, life world is changing. And it's, again, deeply unnatural in the sense of custom to. I want to pivot a little bit, if I may, Slavoj, yeah. and we're going to come on and talk about your... Yeah your book, Hegel and the Wired Brain. And I suppose I wanted to ask you um, a question of a slightly more philosophical nature, which we'll okay. kind of decode. Um, I didn't read your book on the pandemic, but I, I know your book on Hegel, uh, your new one on Hegel. And uh, I wondered I, I whether- I you went stupid enough to read it. Do you know, sorry to interrupt you, a French guy called Pierre Bayard wrote a wonderful book, which is not comical. How to talk about books that you haven't read and he proves empirically, he takes precisely books on Hegel, and he proves that the best interpretations of Hegel are from people who obviously haven't really read Hegel. But that's another Maybe, story. I'm sorry. Go on. I know, I know Hegel is one of the key figures in your yeah. dossier. As it, two of the other key figures in your dossier, I suppose, would be um, Lacan and, yes. uh, and maybe your Kant as well, up to a point. Kant? And I. Yeah. And uh, marks up to a point. Up to a point, exactly. But I wondered in relation to the pandemic, whether there's an argument to be made for something of the status of the virus as something like what Lacan calls l'objet putia. Now we'll have to decode that in some way, but it has to. It has some connections with the, the Kantian ding and sich, the idea of something that's there, which is determinative, but we, which we cannot properly cognitively comprehend. Does that make any sense to you at all as a... In some sense, yes, but I want to, I hope I will make myself, not to you, but to public who doesn't know it understandable. You know, there is a key difference between Kantian think in itself, the way it is independently of us, and what Lacan calls object small a. I will not get lost now in philosophy, just to give you, and for Lacan, Object A is more a kind of a core of a fantasy. It's phantasmatic. Let me give you a simple example. I always use it, but it's understandable. When you fall in love, 
you cannot, you don't ever know. It's not true love if you can perfectly answer the question, why do I love, let's say, that woman? The moment you can do a list, it's not love. You must say it's simply some invisible property. The French have the nice, nice expression, je ne sais quoi, something I don't know what, colors all visible properties. Like, it's not that I like her eyes, but I like her eyes because through them, that mysterious property comes through, shines. And uh, it's the same even in racism. You are not anti-Semite if you say Jews are dirty, uh, gather money, and so on. You have to say they are like that because they are Jews. And what makes them Jews, we don't know. So you see the paradox of Lacan's object A is that it is the real outside our language, operation, symbolization, but at the same time, it's an empty space for for, <coughs> sorry, for phantasmatic uh, project. And exactly this happens with COVID. We are not dealing with simple reality. We project so many things onto it. So COVID-19 could be understood as the vehicle of that phantasmatic projection. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's absolutely clear because, you know, if you look at it in a totally rational, okay, we cannot do this, but at least in common sense, can sense, rational way. Those who claim, but look, much more people are still dying of, uh, of, of, of cancer or whatever. We don't talk about that in these pure numerical numbers and so on and so on. It's a symbolic operation, ideological even, the absolute focus on COVID. You know which makes, what makes me really sad? There are quite a lot of uh, uh, non-developed countries, countries in crisis, where they are in such a horrible situation that COVID is for them simply not the main threat. They almost ignore it. We should never, we should never forget this. Okay, thank you for that, Shlavoy. Can I move us on a bit then? I mean, we talked a tiny bit about... You are the boss, don't ask me. <laughs> uh, master and the slave. Um, Absolutely. I want to move us on to, to talk a little bit about your new book on Hegel. Yeah. And, uh, the title of the book is Hegel in a Wired Brain, which is perhaps a surprising coming together of two, two uh, well, a name and a phrase there. So we'll, we'll come on to that, what the wired brain means. But um, just to start with Hegel for a moment, I, I confess that I was uh, surprised reading the book in your account of Hegel because um, I guess to put it in fairly simple terms, I see Hegel as a philosopher committed to resolution, to the resolution of opposites. And we know he has this phrase in German, which is um, Aufhebung, sometimes translated as uh, sublation in English or Hulev in French yeah, and so yeah, on. So yeah. And essentially what he's saying, to put it very simply, is that we have uh, a positive thing and then we have a negative thing and the two can be resolved into a third higher thing, which includes them both to put it very simply. Yeah. My understanding of your reading of Hegel is about uh, almost anything but resolution and that he keeps, in a, keeps us in a state of irresolution or non-closure or, or again, to put it slightly more philosophically, I read Hegel's dialectic as being about um, uh, sameness in difference, whereas, whereas you emphasize difference in sameness, I suppose, to, if you want yeah. to put a little bit yeah. of on it. So can I just understand, and again, bearing in mind that not everybody in the audience will be a Hegel scholar, can I, can I just ask, to, I guess, paint the broad outlines of how you see Hegelian thought in, in its broadest, in terms of that fundamental move between positive, negative, and the reconciliation into a third term? I think, I of course cannot explain it now in detail, just to give you a couple of formulas. First, I think Hegel is a thinker most open. I don't know any other philosopher to such an extent open to the contingency, unpredict unpredictability of what is coming. Everybody likes to quote Hegel's phrase from the, uh, from the foreword to his philosophy of right, where he says, the all of Minerva, philosophical insight, flies takes off only when the darkness sets in with the evening light. 
you know. But Kegel says what he means. He says that philosophy can only paint its own time, reality, gray on gray. Philosophy can only grasp a form of life when its time has already passed. Hegel says this. And Hegel says, future is not the task of philosophy. That's where I trust Hegel. People who dismiss Hegel as a conservative, celebrating Prussian authoritarian state, they forget that if Hegel was not a total idiot, maybe he wasn't that. Isn't it clear that the same holds for the image of a rational state that he presents in his philosophy of right? He was able to conceptualize it, meaning it's time, it's over. And that's where I see Hegel as a step forward from Marx. Very briefly, first, Marx still thought, and I am ready to see in this the zero level of Stalinism, if you want that we can have a unique historical agent, working class or rather communist party, which knows objectively the history and can act in accordance with history. You do something and you exactly know the historical meaning of it, what you are doing. Hegel strictly prohibits this. Although at the common sense level, every day, his insights are sometimes wonderful. He wasn't an idiot. Read the introduction to his philosophy of history, where, and this was uh, written or rather held as a part of a course in 1821 or two, when he speaks about Russia and the United States. You know what he says? We cannot yet know what these countries will be. Next century will be death. So Hegel is very modest here in contrast to a book that I otherwise appreciate very much, Robert Brandom's the spirit of trust. I think that if there is a basic motive that runs through all of Hegel, it's a spirit on the contrary of distrust. No matter how well your plans are thought in advance, they, there will always be a catastrophe. French revolutionaries wanted the best. Ha <laughs> ha, you get a terror. Uh, Bolsheviks maybe wanted great emancipation. You get Stalinists. Hegel is interested in how things go necessarily wrong. And now I'm coming to your question. I haven't lost the thread. What comes afterwards? It's not some cheap synthesis. Reconciliation is precisely for Hegel. Reconciliation with the horror, the necessity of mistake. The fact that, no, you cannot plan it in advance. You cannot ever take into account the unpredictable consequences of your act. That's the actuality of Hegel. We feel, feel this more than ever today. Fukuyama, he thought, oh, end of history and so on. Ha, ha, ha. Then we are where we are now. No? Let, let me just uh, clarify one thing there, because uh, as you know, that's not, that's not an orthodox reading of Hegel. I just wanted to ask you one thing then. Are you saying that Hegel is committed to unpredictability in the way I do. Absolutely. He even explicitly says this. He says, we cannot talk about it. He repeatedly says this. People just ignore it because people think that Hegel is some kind of a stupid rationalist who thinks reason is progressing. Now we are at the end of history. The best imaginable state forum is discovered. And then we have people with whom I disagree today, I call them the not yet Hegelians. They say, yes, Hegel was basically right, but he didn't know that we are not Let's yet there. For Fukuyama, it's liberal democracy and so on. Thank you. Let, let me just finish the question I was about to ask. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry but yes. Um, so you're saying that Hegel is a philosopher kind of par excellence of unpredictability, uh, but you're also, I think, saying he he pretty firmly predicts catastrophe. So there are some certainties that he's projecting. Yeah, but this is, yes, but this is a kind of a negative predictability. Things necessarily go wrong. Yeah, okay. And Hegel so is obsessed by this. How Hegel, here Hegel is anti-Kantian. Kant is the philosopher of inner intention. What matters is your moral intention. Hegel is almost exactly the opposite. He's a good, pragmatic externalist. It doesn't matter what you mean. The truth of your act is in its consequences. He says this. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a, we've got a fix, I think, on your, your reading of Hegel as this uh, 
committed thinker of the unpredictable, I suppose, and the, the fact that things will necessarily go wrong. Let's then put that together with, uh, or make the conjunction that you make in this book of yours, Hegel in a Wired Brain, because there's two, that way it's an unusual phrase, I think you'll, you'll grant me. It's meant so as well, yeah. Right, so let's, um, let's do the other side of the equation. Let's talk about the wired brain, and then maybe we can connect the two, Hegel and the wired brain. So um, for those of uh, us in the audience, who are perhaps not so familiar with the notion of wired brain or neural link, and particularly the, the notion of singularity with a yeah. capital S, which yeah. may be unfamiliar to some people. Could you just take us through perhaps uh, step by step what, what those terms, or at least how you're using those terms? So wired brain, yeah. first of all, and then singularity second. And the origin of it all is rather simple, although scientifically and technically very complex idea that the idea of directly wiring, connecting to a digital network, our brain processes. So that you don't even, this is Elon Musk's big motto, we don't even have to talk to use language. The computer will directly read our thoughts and we will be able to learn directly. This is the first step and it's, it's like easy to make fun of it, that it's a utopia and so on. But you know that first step, steps are already made in this direction. Let me give you, I don't think I have it to put it in the book. I read just before Corona in February, January, that in some Chinese elementary schools, uh, uh, small kids are already obliged to wear a kind of, a, not even helmet, a metal ring on their head, which measures their brain activity, attention, and so on. So that the teacher gets just a signal from his computer. That guy is not really listening to me and so on. And this elementary stuff, it's already possible. For example, somebody told me that Stephen Hawking, just before his death, he no longer had to use the legendary thing. They enabled a computer in his wheelchair to read. It was very elementary, but it worked. He, he just had to think forward his wheelchair moved forward and so on. Now, the idea of a wired brain is that this can explode into a full-blown contact between our mind and, and a digital network. And then next idea, logical extrapolation of this, if you are connected with a mega uh, uh, digital network and I am, wouldn't it be possible then to directly link our brains through the digital mediation? I think about something, I don't have to explain it to you. You immediately read my thoughts. Then the extreme point of this is so-called singularity. The idea is that if this happens, our brains, ultimately of all humanity, participate in a collective digital brain, and basically the idea is we got a kind of a synthesis between humanity and some divine entity, even moving over the fall. We, our self-awareness becomes directly the self-awareness of God and so on and so on. I don't know very much about the technology of it. What interests me in the book is A, the social consequences, not just social, but also subjective consequences. What would have mean for the two of us to be able to have this type of direct access to the other's mind? What would this do to our sense of freedom and so on? And second point, which is crucial. There only I see a maybe serious contribution of the book. Uh, is there a dimension of, I'm a materialist, but what I'm tempted to call human spirituality, which will nonetheless elude this wired brain or singularity or whatever. Will we, will we be totally enslaved to it? Like I think about something, it's readable to the others, no? First, so what I, my, first I go into detailed analysis of how this would have changed our daily lives. Let's just take, but for me, this is an exemplary case, the case of eroticism. What would remain of erotic interaction? 
let's say you are not you, but sorry for male chauvinist sexism, a nice lady, I am not such a nice man. There is no seduction. We look at each other, do you want to do it? Yes or no, you know. But this is not just to make it easier. The whole point of human language, and this you find already very nicely in Hegel and German idealists, is that you want to say something, but through saying it, that's a dogma of Hegel, you always say more that you, than you wanted to say. And creativity is ultimately this surprise. So we need this gap. The second point I try to make is that isn't our entire... Sorry, please. Yes. Is this the... Is this the, uh, is this the, is this the center uh, between Hegel and the wired brain? The fact that the singularity implies an excess of uh, communication, something more than we ever wish to intend. Which I think even ruins communication. It's no longer communication. That would be my point. Now, why does Hegel see it? Not because he was an atemporal genius who somehow saw the future. No, what fascinates me is precisely the idea, let's take a philosopher who had no idea about wired brain, and I try to imagine how with his totally shocked view, what would he say about it? I think if he were to see it. I think his first reaction would have been, what does this mean to subjectivity? So on the one hand, he would have seen this direct shortcut, which in a way deprives us of what we consider as the focus of our spirituality, which is, I make numerous half funny, boring, repetitive uh, 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 examples I use in my book. From jokes to sexuality, where Failure is part of the success. Like, the success is not a direct success. You try something, you fail, and only in this way, when you try to co-opt or come to terms, cope with your failure, something, something new emerges. That would have disappeared. But I nonetheless, then I go on, and I try to isolate, this is more problematic part, I think, two dimensions where nonetheless something will elude singularity or this collective brain. One is, and that's a nice paradox for me, the authentic Freudian unconscious. Freudian unconscious, I provide here a Lacanian, sorry? Just before you go on to the Freudian, your phrase, the collective brain, just to clarify a point. Are you saying that brain that's what I mean by singularity? I think, yeah. you think, we all participate in the same self-awareness. That, but are you saying the collective brain is the aggregation of subjectivities, or is it now something new where there is no subjectivity? It's something new where it may appear that's my problem. What is subjectivity? Ah, ah, that's the problem I raise. If we mean by subjectivity our inner life in the usual sense of the term, I have my inner life, I smile at you, hi, nice to meet you, who knows what I think. And isn't this maybe the basic component of our sense of freedom? At least in my thoughts, I'm free. My inner reality is here, outer reality is there. The ultimate horror is if outer reality is directly, sorry, if my inner reality becomes totally transparent to some machinery in outer reality. Uh, so uh, I try to do something which I can go into now, it's a pure philosophical exercise, as an old also Cartesian, Descartes, I try to draw a distinction between what Descartes called cogito, cogito, this pure self-reflecting entity of I think, therefore I am, which paradoxically, if you read Descartes in a close way, you will see that this Cogito, neither is, is just a vanishing point, nor does it think. It just thinks that it thinks. So that this subject is to be distinguished from wealth of inner life. That, okay. as already in Kant, it's clear that this, what Kant calls transcendental apperception, is a pure form not to be confused with what Kant would have called pathological which means for him just uh, contingent content. So this is one thing that avoids, sorry, 
but I talk too much, please. That's good. No, that's, that's good. So no, no, but first, then I go to the second point, which is more interesting. Yeah, Why I, is... I, yeah. You're going to talk about the Freudian unconscious, I think. Ah, for me, unconscious is not some kind of a half biologically instinctual deeper core. What I instinctually feel but cannot be rationally formulated rationally. For me, the Freudian unconscious, its status is purely virtual. Virtual in the sense that it's just a virtual. It exists nowhere. Reference point of what I am uh, conscious of. Okay. You know which so actually, example? One of the actually, examples. Sorry. In that sense, uh, shall I avoid the? It's more like the Jungian unconscious than the Freudian unconscious. Isn't no, it? because Jungian unconscious is precisely this deeper, how should I call it, archetypal, deeply ingrained, and so on. But the Freudian unconscious, I claim, is virtual. You know, in what sense? You shouldn't think about unconscious as something deep in you, and so on. It's just imagine, like, ah, you know what would be a nice example, maybe? Magnetism. You throw some little bits of iron. And if the field is magnetic, they will be disposed, let's say, in an inverted U letter. But this U letter doesn't exist. It exists just as a virtual reference point. And I use then similar examples in my book, like the one, hopefully, you, I'm sure, know it, my readers, all, they know it, but many people don't know it. My favorite Hegelian joke from Ernst Lubitsch's movie, Ninochka, where, you know, somebody comes to a cafeteria and says, can I get coffee with cream, please? The waiter says, sorry, we don't have cream, we just have milk. So, since we don't have cream, I cannot give you coffee without cream. I can only give you coffee without milk, no? And you see the paradox. We get in... Each case, you get the same plain coffee. But one thing is coffee, just plain coffee, in symbolic space. Another thing is coffee without milk. A third thing is coffee without cream. They are materially the same. Just this purely virtual reference, milk, cream, is there, but just as a negative point of reference. And my claim is, for example, to make the most brutal quick parallel. This is the status of incestuous desire for the mother. It's just like the shape of, of a, a magnetic field. It doesn't exist. It doesn't mean I really want to have my mother. God forbid. It's just that to account for what happens, you need a purely virtual reference point. So we have another kind of phantasmatic operation. In Please. The there. I, I want to, uh, I, we only have a couple more minutes of the conversation between you and me, Shlomo. <laughs> Let's take time to, on the, uh, the expense of the working class. We can go on, yeah. I'm going to, um, in a second, I'm going to turn to the Q&A, and people have been Good. posting. Uh, yeah. Aren't posting we like people. communist leaders who know better than the people themselves for what is good for them? Okay, so. Right, right. <laughs> well, unfortunately, semi-democratic this evening. But I just wanted to um, ask you before we finish this part of the yeah. conversation, we've covered... Um, We've covered, covered the Hegel part and the wired brain part and a bit of oh, a connection. Yeah. I guess what's your, um, well, to put it very crudely, what's the, the message, the, the, the single thing, the, the key idea you'd like people to take away from your new book? Uh, it's not in the book even. I developed it later. But you know what fascinated me? In Hegel, you find this notion of uh, infinite judgment, which brings together two totally opposite phenomena. Like Hegel's example in his phenomenology is, uh, the Geist is ein Knochen, spirit is a bone. Today's infinite judgment would have been, our spirit is a virus. Now you will say it's a cheap trick. A, A, A. You know that in today's cognitive theory, at least the big names, Daniel Dennett, Dawkins, and so on, explicitly before COVID, define our spirituality as a viral entity, a virus parasitizing on our biological body. So in this sense, in, but our brain is also a viral entity, parasitizing on our body. It can kill it, literally, if we get obsessed by some, as Dawkins called them, mem and so on. So I want the readers to take this, all this madness of epidemics 
as an example to think in a Hegelian way, not in this uh, gentrified way of everything will end up well in some kind of final synthesis. No, everything, it's quite possible that it will not end up well. Very it's good. open. Okay, that's a, that's a great point in which to, uh, yeah. to, ma to make our shift. Now, um, I don't think you can see these, Schlevoy, but I can see a list of questions. No, I cannot. Are. Okay, so I'm going to um, put some of these to you, and, and those of you in the audience, do... Will you read the you questions, can... or will I see them? How will... I, I'll read them to you. Um, okay. I'll put them uh -huh. out of you. And uh, you guys in the audience, if you would like to add to this Q&A, now is the time to do so. Um, <laughs> unlikely we'll have a chance to get through them all, but I, I will pick out... We'll see. I will try to be short here, yes. Yeah. If you... Okay, so the first one I will pick out here we go. Do you have any opinions on cancel culture, especially after the recent riots in the US? Well, I can only say this. I am a well-known opponent of political correctness, but I think that the famous uh, letters, letter signed by, I don't know how many intellectuals uh, published in Harper's, no? I think people didn't notice enough the two types of individuals signing. On the one hand, the old-fashioned liberals, for whom political correctness goes too far, it's too fanatic, and so on. I also problematize political correctness, but from the opposite side. I think it's radicality, it's a fake one. Yes, you are obsessed. Did I use that expression? Was it a little bit racist, or and so on? But there is a deep hypocrisy in it. In the sense of, for me, political correctness is an example of how you can be radical in a false way, that is to say, without addressing the true causes of racism, injustice, and so on and so on. So never confuse the two. That would be my answer to this. I am against cancel culture. I was often a target for it and so on. But I never saw it as, oh my God, these guys are too fanatic. No, they are compromised. Like, just one detail to the guy, who, maybe it will also amuse you. You know, whenever I have debates with politically correct people, how often I notice that behind their radicality, they have secret, unwritten, unspoken rules. Like, we have to fight against racism, but then you learn that there are unwritten codes of which my minority really counts as one, and which not, and so on and so on. There is so much hypocrisy in it. So again, yeah. I'm from a more radical position against cancel culture. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so that first question was from David. David, thank you. I've got one now from Ronan. He asks, is there any sense in which mother nature, as intelligent, could communicate through a stupid virus? It seems oh. obvious to me Pandemic is a means of life communicating with itself. Why it all depends, you must know better than me as a philosopher about this. You know, it all depends on what do you mean by communication? Do you mean, does communication imply intention? The mo if you imply intention in the sense of there is some deeper spiritual, or however you conceive it, subject called nature, which wants to give us a message, then I would say no, because my answer would have been surprising here. If we can learn anything from Freud, is that we don't even know how to communicate with ourselves, my God, you know. It's all one big mess. It's, I'm not saying we shouldn't analyze epidemics as to its social conditions, possible effects, but in a Hegelian spirit, just allow me 20 seconds, uh, uh, I find here, this is for me the Hegelian spirit of contingency, many paradoxes possible. You know, it's horrible, but you know what I read somewhere, you remember in the middle of the epidemics, when the, ecology, no, the, the, the pollution of the air above China and India got much lower, the air was better. But there were, uh, there were meteorologists who convinced me with their analysis, I read them in detail, I was even able to understand them, that precisely of this cleaner air, the, you remember a couple of months ago, late spring uh, tornadoes in India, Bangladesh, were so much stronger. You always pay the price. You don't know what will happen. You know, 
Okay. So this, in this sense, I think there is no deeper message. All messages for me are retroactive. They come afterwards. I believe also in this sense in the hermeneutic openness of history. You know, idiots, my good friends, but I call them like this, say, to really understand Shakespeare, you have to know Elizabethan England. No, I would say. To really know what Elizabeth England was, really was, read Shakespeare. And to understand Shakespeare, you have to read him from today's perspective. Shakespeare didn't know really what he wanted to say. It's a confusion. Today, we can understand him better than he was able to understand him. Okay. okay. Um, thank you, Levoy. Here we go. It, uh, Jeff. A question from Jeff. It would be interesting yeah. to hear how Schlavoy squares this concept of digital consciousness vis-a-vis -vis the wide brain with dialectical materialism, which admits to exclusively physical or cellular existence in all things. Two points here. First, when I used, my God, the term dialectical materialism, it's of course meant as the ultimate serious joke, but a joke. Like, if you mean by dialectical materialism, what Stalin did and uh, his followers and so on and so on. Do you know, by the way, that dialectical materialism is not a term which you find anywhere in Marx or Engels. It was, I think, invented by the beginning of all stupidity in Marxism, the Russian uh, first great Marxist, Georgi Plekhanov. Never think. So what I'm saying is that, especially, I insist this, and my friend Frank Ruda wrote a book on it, materialism without matter. For me, materialism doesn't mean, if you look in detail, you will find some tiny parts which are jumping around there. Materialism just means it's a blind, blind, meaningless process, meaningless in the sense of not controlled by any awareness, intention, and so on. Otherwise, it can be purely bodiless or whatever. For me, the greatest materialists are quantum physicists, and so on. So that's my first point. Uh, Dialectical materialism is not this Stalinist obsession with you must find some tiny uh, uh, bits of matter. No, sorry, what was the first part of the question? This was the second part. Yeah, so it would be interesting to hear how you square the concept of digital consciousness. Ah, I, don't, I don't believe in this concept. I think it's a myth. I don't think if singularity will exist, it will be just blind machinery and still our individual consciousness. I don't this is why, in the chapter that I prefer poetically in the book, the last of the, of the seven treatises, you remember, I, I read singularity as something that will effectively, if it will be realized, look like Sam Beckett's unnameable. You know, this uh, uh, confused self-conversation of an autistic madman or whatever. No, I don't, I absolutely, precisely, don't believe in this collective, that would have been Jung really, collective awareness. I think awareness is irreducibly singular. It's um, uh, interesting that you call dialectical materialism a joke. Because to annoy friends, question, to annoy friends. Because, because the next question yeah. from Ruth is, can you tell us a joke? So maybe you've already told us it. It's dialectical materialism. Maybe we'll get a few laughs. I, 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 you know oh my gosh. Yes. I'll, I'll, let, I'll save that for the last question. So you have 10 minutes to prepare your best joke for us to end on. Okay? I can, my God, I cannot, because you know, all good jokes, I use them, I use them obsessively, you know. So, okay, I'll try, let's go on, okay. Come back to that, that will be your parting shot, okay? Okay. Uh, on to the next one. Does assigning blame for present political oppositions to ideas and institutions suggested by the term neoliberalism, reasonable or irritating? Irritating, not, you know why? First, as all good analysts, beginning by my friend Varoufakis, who is not stupid, although I don't always agree with him, but I love him, point out, neoliberalism, wouldn't you agree? It's a false term, it can be proven, even economically, that even under Reagan, Bush, even Margaret Thatcher, state apparatus is effectively were gaining strength. I think neoliberalism doesn't, if you look at the actuality of today's capitalism, 
capital needs more and more state regulations, even direct interventions to function. I think neoliberalism is in this sense a fake term. States are getting stronger. And even, I would say, even within the capitalist universe, the, those states which function well today, let me take three examples, at least till now. Uh, China, South Korea, Singapore. Extremely strong state intervening, uh, combining in a wonderful way. Liberal market, you can invest, uh, reap profit and so on, with very strong social state intervention. That's for me what is deceiving in the term neoliberalism. It's used to put pressure on less, de less developed states, like if you want to screw some African state, you say you should liberalize enough. It means they should open up more for our neocolonial <laughs> exploitation. But neoliberalism in the sense of the importance of state is disappearing, it's just big corporation. Which, no, big corporation absolutely need state mechanisms. That's what irritates me. Okay. Um... Here's an anonymous question. Is there an issue with self-awareness to inner unconscious or are there parts to our unconscious we will never understand? First, the unconscious ultimately is not something that we can understand. It's now we are in Lacanian sphere. I think that if you look deeply into your mind, already with Freud, you don't find some ultimate deep message, you find fantasies, imaginary formations, with which your unconscious tries to introduce some order into the chaos of your life. And they, in some sense, they are meaningless. They are contingent formations and so on and so on. Also, this inner unconscious. I don't like the term, but I don't have the time to go into it now. For precise theoretical reasons, I often like to quote how the series my God with David Duchovny about extraterrestrial, which began with you know, the truth is out there. I think unconscious for Freud is not hidden, hidden deep within you. This is why even if I may betray to you and people who listen to us now my inner secret, I myself hate psychoanalysis. I don't want it applied to myself. Yeah, I'm sorry. You cut out at the key moment there. You said, I myself, something. Uh, hate hate to be psychoanalyzed. I think... If you look deep into me, as in every other person, you find some shit, dirty private secrets, and so on and so on. I'm not worthy of attention for this. I don't. I believe in what's interesting is what I do publicly. If you look deep into me, you will find what what you find with every person: some dirty private fantasy, some nasty. I don't know what sexual pervert secrets and so on. Is this really interesting? No. So I, for me. To be inner is not a good thing. What is within us is shit. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm gonna have, we've got time for just probably a couple more questions. So okay, let's try. Know. I will try to be even shorter. Okay. Uh, okay. Today we can see many ways of life disintegrate or possibly come to an end. This is sad but is it necessarily bad? Is it a bad thing that we see some things evaporate in our current culture? Eh, here I'm a Hegelian. We don't know it in advance, that's the problem. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. And it's not even objectively predetermined. It doesn't mean that if we were to know everything, we would be able to say that, fish, that, that species of fishes have off, they can disappear, or that other species Plays, plays a crucial role because every radical change rearranges all of it. And only through this contingent rearrangement can we retroactively say this was good, this was bad. I want to be very attentive here. I'm not saying everything can be retroactively justified. There are some crazy anti-Semites, but even some radical Jews that I know who claim this partially justifies Holocaust. We did, nonetheless, Jews got their state. You know, some crazy anti-Semites even claim that Jews themselves organized Holocaust to get the state. They were ready to sacrifice half of them. I think this is a false perspective. 
it's not, nothing can be justified in this sense retroactively. Just something horrible happens and then it may serve to something which wasn't part of the intention at all at the beginning. Okay. So uh, we don't know in advance, it's okay. open. So the eagle takes wing at, uh, at dusk. Yeah, yeah. Um, ah, that's wonderful what you say. I want to quote you. You exchanged the stupid owl with the eagle. You said the eagle. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. You know what it's from? I, and I, I was going to quote it to you earlier. It's from Derrida's book, Gla, where he talks about uh, the debris of uh, civilizations that Hegel uh, goes on to talk about. He talk yeah, about the, you know, uh, that's why I like the, the period of romant sorry, romanticism. You know that at yeah. that point, they discovered debris as something beautiful. Not like... They, even some German princes, around 1800, I read some of before, they directly built on that estate debris, like a half-ruined house, but they built it like that. That's a great thing. Okay, I think probably this might be our last question before I ask you to tell your joke. Oh, um, if we're to, this is about how to resist singularity. So if we are to resist sing singularity, do we resist it in a traditional form, i.e. by opposing it directly as an oppositional force yeah. standing outside, yeah. or can we subvert singularity as a form of resistance from within it? So do we resist I didn't singularity? I use the term resistance. I would just say, I would translate this into my terms. Is there a dimension in our being subject which eludes singularity? And my answer is yes pure form of subjectivity and the unconscious. So the point is, is not to resist it. I think we will have to go through this zero point if it will be technically possible. I just want to raise this question, will we be doomed? Just a cog in the machinery of the collective singularity. I think not. I'm not a pessimist here. My, the message of my book is not as pessimist as it may sound. Okay, well, maybe I can squeeze in one other question, there, okay. which is sort of related. <laughs> how, how do you see a post-COVID society? Will you, will you foresee a radical shift of sorts? Possible, but again, the same answer as to your, uh, is the disappearance of some species good as bad? That's why I am saying in shock to many of my friends that we live now in an exquisitely political moment. It's clear that the old form of life is disappearing. And, uh, but that's my point. COVID epidemics is not this zero point where politically nothing happens, it's just an emergency. No, now already we are, although we are not explicitly fighting it, in the process of experimenting, experimenting with different forms of future. We have Trump-Bolsonaro future. The old order should be maintained even if many people die and so on. We have the technocratic digital vision. New culture, everything is kept at a distance and so on and so on. And uh, I hope that something that I provocatively call communism, but I don't mean with this central committee or a new collectivism. I mean how even conservative politicians are, did you notice this, are doing things which if somebody were to propose them a year ago, he would have been called a oh, crazy radical leftist. Boris Johnson temporarily nationalized the railways. Uh, Trump is introducing uh, some form of almost universal basic income and so on and so on. So just keep this in mind. Again, it's open. There are three, four options, which is why I wrote a text, which unfortunately I think is not included in the book. It just appeared somewhere. Do you know, or some of my readers, if they know it, my favorite science fiction short story? Uh, Robert Checkley, Star of the World. That's our situation now. We are like choosing, the problem is that we are not even aware of it, but the future is forming now what will be the post-COVID society. On the other hand, it will not be a simple post-COVID. Even if we, we cope with this viral infection, there is global warming and so on and so on, you know, like, yeah. So Shlavoj, our, our time is, is pretty much up and we're gonna let, let people get on with their evening in a moment. So now we're going to have a big drum roll and you are going to tell us your joke. Better be a good one. My favorite joke, but I repeat it from one of my books. And it's uh, 
maybe it will be a nice comment on your idea of Hegel as dialectical synthesis, no? It's not a very funny joke, but I like it because I'm still traumatized by Stalinism. It's a joke from 1930s, one of my earlier books, I used it. Uh, uh, at the Politburo, they debate, debate, will there be money in communism or not? First, you have Bukharin, right-winger. Of course, money is a natural medium of exchange. Of course, there will be money. Then there are uh, radical Trotskites who say, no, money is alienation. There will be no money. And then Comrade Stalin wisely intervenes and says, no, it will be, here I come to you, dialectical synthesis of both. There will be money and there will not be money. And you ask him, oh my God, what a great idea. But tell us, Comrade Stalin, how do you mean it? You know he, what he answers. Very simply, some people will have money, other people will not have money. <laughs> I like this turn towards vulgarity, you know. Not bad. Well, there, there you go. It doesn't work out as a philosopher for you. You know, you may have another career on the comedy circuit. So thank Very you. Good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But you know why I'm doing this? I compare myself to American preachers in Wild West who first they were magicians telling jokes to attract attention, then they went to the serious stuff. I like very much to have this idea that through jokes and so on, people will get what I'm saying. I never enjoyed jargon as such. Shlavoj Zizek, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this evening. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank and I'm honored by your questions. Can you just give me one word as the last question? You kept this a secret. You are a philosopher. What kind of? Give me one, two big names. What's your orientation? Derrida. That's interesting. I didn't know that. I don't agree with Derrida, but he is intelligent, you know. Well, Great. this is not I, you the interviewing you, so we'll, I'll squirm out of that one and uh, ask Vaz to to bring the evening to a close and thank everybody for joining us today. Thank Thanks. you, Slavoj. Thanks. Thank you, that.